Are you looking for a fun and informative podcast all about training working dogs? Look no further than the LWDG Pod Dog. This weekly show is hosted by me, Joanne Perrot, founder of the Ladies Working Dog Group, and I chat to experienced trainers and experts in the field who will give you helpful tips and advice. Whether you're just getting started or you've been working dogs for years, this podcast will have something for you. So pull up a chair, pour yourself a cup of coffee, and tune in to LWDG Paw Dog, and let us help you build a better bond with your best friend. Hello and welcome to another episode of LWDG Pod Dog. This week I'm joined by the fabulous LWDG Group experts Samantha Thornycroft Taylor and Claire Denya, and we are going to be talking all about resource guarding. Hello, ladies. How are you this lovely evening? Yes, I'm very well, thank you, Joe. And how are you? Sam? I'm good, thanks, Joe. I'm good, thank you. Would you like to introduce yourselves to our audience? Claire, if we go with you first. Yep. So my name is Claire Denya and I make up part of the team with my husband of Family Dog Services and we are based in Maidstone in Kent. And Sam? Hi, I'm Sam Thornycroft Taylor of Languedoc Gun Dogs in Gloucestershire. Um, we are a gun dog and training obedience centre. So ladies, we're going to be talking all about resource guarding this evening. So let's start with probably the fundamental question. What is resource guarding? Okay, so resource guarding is a really interesting topic and a lot of people only think or consider that resource guarding is the issue when their dog is perhaps being aggressive towards them around food. Um, but there's a whole host of things that dogs can resource guard, um, including um, toys, their possessions, areas, so their sleeping areas, even your areas, sofas, beds and the such like, um, and even you, they can, they can actually view their owner as something that they want to guard and be territorial over. I think Claire covered that really well, actually, um, and pretty much sort of summed up everything. I think, the, as Claire said, the most common um, understanding if you like or misunderstanding of resource guarding is that people assume when a dog is aggressive over something that that is when it becomes resource guarding and that something can be um, you know the, those places people food items anything like that but it doesn't always have to be the aggression that comes out you know it can be um, noise or any other certain behavior can also be covered within the resource guarding topic Okay, so for me to understand a little bit more about it and for the audience to maybe understand a little bit about it, why do dogs resource guard? What, what starts it or what triggers it? Well, it can depend on what we're talking about. So if we just cover a little bit about the different types of things, that might help to expand on that a little bit. So as we said earlier, one of the first things that springs to people's mind is food. Um, but that's not just thinking about a bowl of food. It could be food that they find on the floor. So it could be things out on a walk when they come across something on the floor and they don't want you to have it. So as Sam just touched on, so different things they do, some dogs will swallow it as quickly as they can. So it's not necessarily aggression toward you, but they might swallow something as quickly as they can just to prevent you getting it. Other dogs might actually run off and try and bury or hide something to stop you getting it. Some might actually put it in their bed and then it would appear that they're guarding the bed, but they're actually sort of possessing that. It could be a bone, you know, something they've picked up off the floor. Um, but when we look at things like that, that's definitely the dog um, being possessive or territorial over food. But then with territory, it could be something really simple like a blanket um, that they sleep on on their bed. It could be the actual bed. Um, it could be your sofa or your bed. And it might be that you don't notice there's a problem with that until you try and move the dog off of your sofa or your bed and the dog refuses to get off. 
um, quite often in that scenario, you might get vocalised sort of behaviour, usually a growl. Um, and then also with their toys. So one of the reasons that we teach in our classes all dogs to retrieve is because we're teaching them the concept of sharing. Dogs that resource guard don't share. <laughs> they, they're claiming things for themselves. So teaching a dog to retrieve is helping to teach them to share. Um, so if your dog is one that wants to guard toys or, and won't give something back, it could be just that it, it wants you to play tuggy, but it could be that it's actually being possessive over that item. Does that help make it seem a bit clearer? Whereas maybe people think the resource garden is just um, what we potentially see like on TV shows now where they're growling, they're really aggressive. If you go near the food bowl, there are other types of resource garden like the ones that you just mentioned. Sam, it's sort of like then, for example, if a dog won't give you um, a dummy after it's retrieved, is that a resource garden? It can be, and that's where it becomes a really complex issue that is quite difficult to understand at times because um, Claire mentioned there, you know, it could be the dog doesn't want to give it to you because actually it it's, enjoys a game of tug. Maybe it's been conditioned to enjoy a game of tug with you. Maybe it's just decided that that is the sort of thing it likes to do. Um, you know, it could be just showboating around and having a bit of a parade and look at me, this is fantastic, look what I've got. But by the same token, it could be resource guarding that item. It could be saying, um, no, this is mine now and I don't want to share it, which why is why, firstly, why it's that complex issue, but also why, like Claire said just now, it's so important to teach young dogs um, and older dogs, rescue dogs, you know, you can re teach them retrain them and, and re-educate them but young dogs being so um well they're like sponges aren't they they take everything in you know teaching them from an early age to share and share everything share my space share the item um you know with whilst having rules and boundaries as well so you know don't you don't have to share your bed if your rule in your house is you don't want your dog sleeping on your bed then the rule is the dog doesn't sleep on your bed if you want to share your bed with your dog, then it has to be an equal share rather than one party or rather than the dog being able to say, no, you're not allowed in bed tonight because I've decided it's mine. I think, I think that's really important what Sam just covered there. And I have very um, sort of standardised rules and boundaries in my house regarding furniture. So my dogs do come up on the sofa for a cuddle but it's on my terms. So the dog asks to come up and when I ask them to get off, they get off. The sofa belongs to me and I'm choosing to share it with the dog. The sofa doesn't belong to the dog. And that's a really important thing. And, you know, sometimes we get calls from people whose dogs, you know, they can't even sit on the sofa or as I touched on at the beginning, when I said um, that some dogs, um, might actually start to guard their owner and you do get incidences I'm sure Sam's you know had calls about it where cu couples can't cuddle they can't share space because the dog gets very jealous and of course being humans we humanize that behavior and we're like oh the dog's really jealous you know look I'm having a cuddle with my husband and the dog wants to join in but actually quite often there can be much more worrying behavioural problems going on there in that the dog is actually seeing one of that partnership, the husband or the wife, as their territory and is guarding their space. That's quite fascinating really, isn't it? Because you think, like I said a moment ago, you think of it, of it in this aggressive way. Mm -hmm. But it could basically be starting with quite simple things, with like, laying on your lap won't let somebody near you and it doesn't have to be that flat out um, aggressive growling dog we'd expect to see so how can we avoid resource gardening because you know where does it even start and, and what do we need to do so with puppies there's a lot of things that we can do and teach the puppy to help prevent these problems now it's always worth considering that their early social experiences um, that they might have in the litter 
um, can also um, play a part in how the dog behaves as it gets older. Um, for instance, if a puppy has had to fight or compete for its food, um, or it's been bullied by other puppies in the litter or by other puppies at puppy school and things like that, you know, puppy play dates and things like that, then it can negatively affect a young dog's behaviour as it matures. And sometimes um, behaviours that you see can backtrack right to things like that. But when we get a puppy home, one of the things that I do, I mean, there was a very old fashioned method and I'm sure Sam will know of more. But one that always springs to my mind is people were often told to teach their dog to respect the food bowl, respect the owner with the food bowl, to keep taking it away, keep removing that food bowl while the dog was eating. Well, if somebody kept taking my food away while I was trying to eat, they'd probably get stabbed in the hand by a fork I'm exaggerating there I wouldn't actually do that but I would be angry about that and it would make me feel more possessive over my food so in contrast to that what I do with puppies is I'll put a little bit of their meal in their food and then I'll add more food to the bowl so the puppy sees my hand approaching the bowl as a really positive thing. The dog isn't going to be freaked out by my hand coming down to the bowl thinking I'm going to take its food away. So I just wanted to uh, jump in on that bit because um, one of the reasons I wanted to be involved with this podcast, um, some of you know that we recently took on a large dog um, who was a massive resource guarding dog, possessive, aggressive, uh, got massively over the top about a lot of things. And one of his biggest issues was food. Um, and that's not to say that his previous owners had done anything wrong. He just, in his nature and potentially with his slight lack of sort of rules and boundaries in other areas as a whole, had decided food was his. And that was it. No one was coming near him. Um, he had not let his previous owners remove his collar on one occasion while he was eating. And it, it you know, didn't end as well as it could have done. Not in a really nasty way, but, you know, they then felt a little bit scared of him, particularly around food. So when he arrived, he would almost attack his food bowl. You know, you'd put his food down in front of him. And even if you stood backwards out of the way, he would just try and wolf the whole lot down in one. And it would be a very protective stance over his bowl. You know, his, his legs would be wide, his shoulders would be wide. He'd be towering over the bowl. And if you went to go anywhere near, he'd start snarling, snarling and growling. And like Claire said, the, the traditional, the old method would have been basically to have said to the dog, well, I don't care what behaviour you're displaying at me, I'm going to have it. If you're going to treat me like that, I'm going to take your bowl away. But for him and for most other dogs, it doesn't work. All it does is make them more protective, more possessive, and therefore more aggressive to their food bowl. So with him, again, like Claire, I sat next to him and I made sure it was all safe. So I had him in a large crate. I was able to shut the door crate in a hurry if I needed to. But I was basically just, there wasn't much food in his bowl and I was drip feeding that food to him, um, you know, so that he began to see my presence as a good thing to the food bowl. As with all things behavioral, particularly resource guarding, and we are going to touch on this later, this way of doing it and the way that Claire described for young puppies worked for this dog only this dog I can see this dog in front of me it's not something that you can now generically take away and use for every other dog because every every dog every situation is different so with your young puppies possibly with your older dog you can use things like this to use that positive association with the food bowl with the person being present um, but you obviously must seek proper advice if you're having a real issue it's really interesting to think as well though thank you for that story sam um is this sort of problem resource guarding is it breed specific because you're talking about a very large dog acting very much one way it, do we not see it like in our spaniels and labs or is, is it more prevalent in our gun dogs how is there any sort of pattern to this Personally, I don't think it is wholly breed specific. I think any breed can become a resource guarding and or possessive dog. Um, and a lot of it is with the upbringing, um, you know, the behaviours that we, things that we inadvertently do as a puppy, or like Claire said, before we've even got them home at eight weeks old, 
So it could be your large breed dog. It could be a Spaniel. It could be a Labrador. It could be the Chihuahua down the road. Any dog can be um, molded, if you like, into being possessive or resource guarding. Yeah, Sam's right. You know, um, we see so many different breeds for resource, resource guarding behaviours. But one of the things that um, I've also noticed, and Sam, you might have noticed this too, is um, dogs that do a lot of attention seeking can easily start to develop resource guarding issues because they're finding ways of getting your attention and getting um, a reaction out of you. So a couple of dogs that I've been to see that the owners um, were having issues with resource guarding, the dogs had massive issues with general um, attention-seeking behaviours and had almost learned that by stealing things and keeping things and behaving this way, I get your attention. Um, with those specific dogs, yes, it is still resource guarding, but they didn't have intent to bite but they certainly had intent on I'm going to get your attention and this is mine and you can't have it back. And that comes back to what Sam was saying earlier about um, some breeds when they're retrieving, um, you know, playing keep away. It can all start a little bit like that, but these things can, you know, increase and the behaviours can deteriorate and start to become more serious. But very often resource guarding is, it's quite simply, quite often a symptom of a lot of other things that are going wrong with that dog. The other place that I've seen it come in a lot, again, not breed specific at all, and Claire, I don't know if you found this too, is that going back to what Claire was saying about husband and wife and the dog sort of, you know, potentially uh, protecting one, when children come into a family, that can then have a massive effect on the dog. They're used to their nice little cosy family. I've got mum, I've got dad, this is fine. And then all of a sudden there's this needy screaming thing that has appeared and is needing all of my mum and dad's attention. And so therefore, sometimes a dog that maybe had a, a few attention-seeking behaviours as a youngster, but then grew up and was fine those things might start to come back in again because all of a sudden they're feeling like they're not being as involved as they perhaps were before. And we hear those stories, sadly, very rarely, do we, where the, the children have been attacked, where adults have perceived as being out of nowhere, but as um, you are discussing now, it, it may be a case of they were underlying symptoms anyway before this happened. Yeah, absolutely. I mean... When children are involved, obviously, it's, very, it's, it's serious anyway. But when children are involved, obviously, it's very serious and professional help needs to be sought very, very quickly before things escalate because inadvertently, quite often, um, people can make the situation worse by the way they react to the dog's behaviours. I'm sure that from our sort of dog and duck evenings and from different conversations we've had with our ladies, there have been lots of times when dogs have shown no sort of symptoms, no um, resource garden at all, when they brought in something like um, a raw bone, raw meat, some type of food that is maybe out of the ordinary, that will trigger it. So are we to think that maybe we have to watch all our dogs, if that makes sense? We can't always 100% trust them. I think in situations like that, it, it's always worth considering how we react. So a lot of the time people won't realise that they act differently when their dog picks something up it shouldn't have or something really high value. And a lot of the time the way the owner responds can trigger a sudden behaviour like that. Um, so, I mean, dogs are dogs. At the end of the day, dogs are dogs and you know, things will happen, things do happen, but a lot of the time, our behaviour or the puppy's very early, uh, very early on um, experiences, um, and sometimes genetics all play a part in how dogs behave. But, you know, if you've generally got a really nice, well-mannered dog who doesn't behave that way, and there's a one-off incident, I, I would often put money on the fact that the owners actually responded in a way that's created something there for sure. 
I think, yeah, it can be, it could be something as simple as, you know, when the dog suddenly turned, if you were too close to it with this new high value raw bone that it's never had before, you mm -hmm. might have jumped back in shock. It might have taken you unawares, you know, and some dogs will react to the fact that you jumped more than the fact that you're anywhere near the bone that they were really quite enjoying. Some dogs are, in my mind, you know, quite clever, if you like, in that if the owner through a series of events, so not just a one-off, has shown a bit of fear or maybe the dog has done a tiny little growl and so that the owner is, has in shock, you know, snatched their hand away quite suddenly, some dogs go, ah, ah. okay, so that works, does it? So then they repeat that. And then if the owner's behavior gets worse or their reaction is, is more, then the dog's behavior gets worse. Like Claire said, dogs will be dogs. And nine times out of 10, in my opinion, you know, resource guarding comes about because of something that we have done as owners, as handlers, and we can shape the dog's behavior and, and shape their personality from a young age. Um, if you've got a dog that is, you know, 99.9% .9 absolutely fine most of the time then there's no reason to fear giving it something like a bone and actually if you do fear giving it a bone you're more likely to trigger a response from the dog because they will sense your emotions anyway and a hundred percent um another thing that you know I will mention that I have personally seen quite a lot there has been a massive increase in dog aggression over the last few years, without a doubt. And resource guarding being one of those behaviours, one of those aggressive behaviours that we are seeing more and more and more of. And I do think we need to look at how we are with our dogs, the relationship with our dogs, you know, and that we're educating the dog. And one of the things that comes up in conversation so much, and I know we've talked about it on Dog and Duck, like, a trillion times um is limitations with things like trading with your dog swapping with your dog for something higher value because if, if we if we don't teach the dog to share which is essentially what we want to teach the dog is to share and to want to be proud and give us things um if we're trading all the time and then one day what the dog has what we have to trade isn't going to out out value that item in their mouth we're making a rod for our own back because the dog's going well let me see here i have this you have that i think i'll keep this and then you're stuck so we have to teach dogs it's not about trading or bribing or any of those things it's about we're sharing because we have a really solid mutual trust I trust you, you trust me, we're a partnership, we're a team. It's not about being a bully. It's not about being more dominant than your dog and any of that kind of, you know, nonsense. But it's about we're a partnership. This isn't a trade-off. This is how this relationship works. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I can see how, as you're describing more of what um, resource garden is and what causes it and, and how we see it sort of, develop maybe or potentially in a dog I can see how that swapping thing then does potentially become an issue because like you said if you haven't got anything that the dog wants what do you trade for now? Yeah. You could be standing there empty-handed in the middle of the field going I have nothing to swap with you know and, and then you know that's when people become very unstuck you know, and I and I think, you know, we have to be very careful that the way we interact with the dogs isn't teaching them that, well, I only give this up if you do this for me. No, no, no. We share. This is how this works. We're a partnership. I think often the other way that or the other reason that it's this non-sharing comes in is when your young puppy picks up something in the house that they're not supposed to have. It could be a pair of glasses. It could be the TV remote. It could be a children's toy, you know anything like that but again our reaction to them picking it up is what starts this chain happening because whereas when we've thrown a, a ball or a toy for a dog and you know we've sat on the floor and we've willingly thrown it and then we're willing them and we're being nice and easy going and calm but exciting trying to get them back when they pick up something they're not allowed as a human the instant reaction is to go no you can't have that so we're shouting at the dog we're probably running after the dog. You know, I've got in my head, I've got visions of the dog being chased by the human around the coffee, round and round and round, around the coffee table in the living room because 
the dog's like, no, you're chasing me. You're not having this back. And the human's going, but I need it back because you're going to chew it. And the dog learns that this is a really, really fun game. And actually, my, my human chasing me all day is hilarious to me. So that, again, can bring in then issues of this, you know, their resource guarding at that point. It's not, there's no aggression involved at all. But they're not wanting to give things up. And it can lead on then to them stealing more items because it spurs that reaction that they find funny. I think exactly that, Sam, and it's something that we really talk to our puppy clients about so much um, is how they are like that. And, and as you just said, you know, people will actually say, I chased my dog around the sofa, it hid under the table, it hid behind the sofa. But the other thing that people say on that exact same thread is they'll say the dog picked up something it knew it shouldn't have. Well, it's only the way we respond to it that will make that dog believe they shouldn't pick it up. All of my dogs pick up things in my house, okay? If it's on the floor and it gets picked up, it gets picked up. But there's never any, I'm, you're not having this back business because I've taught the dogs to share. So John gets home from work. He gets taken his slippers. It's just how our life is in this house, you know. I might get brought something. Um, whatever's around, I might get brought as a gift. The, the, the dogs want to give it to me as a gift. So I have no problem with them picking stuff up. Um but if your dog picks up a shoe and you start squealing about it and chasing the dog around the garden, you suddenly made that dog think, ha ha, this shoe is something I can now keep and she has to chase me to get it. And as Sam said, that can spiral into actual problems with the dogs starting to learn a behaviour that you don't want them to have. Because that behaviour then is not only going to potentially lead to resource garden or is it already on its way to resource garden but then for our gun dogs that that's a whole extra problem in itself again yeah i talk about that in my reluctant retriever masterclass. one of the most common causes of reluctant retrievers is how people have responded to their puppies picking up items around the house it can also if if they've responded with this whole you can't have that i'm chasing you if the dog learns the game of chase and that the human chasing the dog is great fun, it can transfer over into things that don't even involve items. So maybe you've got to the end of your walk, you want to put your dog's lead on, you take half a pace towards your dog with the lead in your hand, and the dog bounces away. And it's already saying, chase me. And mm -hmm. nine times out of 10 as a human, we then take a step forward and we go, yeah, okay, I'll chase you because I want to put the lead on. So the dog bounces away again. So something as simple as, they picked up the TV remote and we squealed and we chased them can have then this big effect on a, a multitude of different behaviours. And if you think about it, chase is probably one of the first games a pup plays with other pups. It's like you see it every single litter, they chase each other back and forth, they take turns who's being chased. So to them, it is actually probably one of the most fun things they can possibly do. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, you know, and, and I do. I play chase with my dogs, but the difference is they chase me. I will never, ever chase them, but I'm more than happy for them to chase me because they're coming towards me and they're keeping their focus on me. So we still carry on that, you know, puppy play game, even into way into adulthood, eight, nine, 10 year old dogs. You can chase me, but I'm never going to chase you. It kind of, when you look at it, even from a gun dog training perspective, I know we're talking about resource guarding, but behaviours create, behaviours that we have create behaviours in dogs without a doubt. And quite often you will hear people say, if the dog doesn't recall, get out after the dog. Well, <laughs> um, there's a bit of an issue with that. One, I could never catch my dog if I tried. Um, secondly... If your dog enjoys that, you're going to only make that problem a lot worse. So as Sam said, you know, you want the dog wanting to come back to you. You know, if my dog ignores a stop whistle and it's a train stop whistle, I'll walk out and I'll pop a lead on it and I'll walk it back to where it's ignored the stop whistle, sit it up and continue. But you're never going to see me legging it across the field chasing the dog because that's not going to end well for me. <laughs> We've talked a little bit about what resource garden is what they can resource over, why they may resource, 
how we can possibly avoid it from a, from a puppy's age, you know, making sure that we, we look at things in a different way. If I'm listening to this and I have a dog with a resource garden issue that I'm concerned about, what are the steps forward? Well, a couple of things I will just mention. If you already have a dog in your household that is a resource guarder, then and you're considering a second dog, you want to get that resource guarding sorted before you get a second dog. I wouldn't be bringing a second dog into a home where you've already got one that's got resourced in behaviours happening. And equally, if you have got a multi-dog household and you've got a dog resourcing, uh, resource, resource guarding, you need to be very careful with interactions with dogs, with things that might guard and certainly seek professional help. Yeah, and it's I think because resource guarding, a lot, as well as other complex behaviours, but this one is particularly complex and no one dog is the same as the next dog they can be on the outside they can be seemingly displaying the same thing perhaps both of them for example have stolen a log out of the log basket and they both get possessive over it but we need to look at the bigger picture so you can never say that this one way of dealing with it will fix both or all dogs it's really important to find someone um, that can properly look and fit you know physically in person look at the behavior both of you and your dog in that situation and they can then advise accordingly you cannot get appropriate information online or via a telephone call or anything like that you have to have someone with you so they can see the specifics of what's going on at hand yeah because as we've you know we've laughed and joked about some part of resource garden like chasing and having fun and going on the coffee table but this could potentially lead to a situation where someone is going to get hurt and that if that's someone's child we are we are going to be kicking ourselves that we didn't get somebody in earlier to deal with the problem yeah totally you you, you have to get professional help for behavioral problems um especially ones where you know aggression is involved and with resource guarding it can escalate quite quickly and especially if there's children in the house as well you know you've got to be very careful of things like that so seeking professional advice you know um obviously if sam works with a client and then her dog a client's dog is developing a problem she already knows that dog it's easy for her to to advise on that dog because she knows it vice versa if I've got a gun dog client and um, their dog is starting to display behavioural problems at home, it's quite easy for me to help them because I already know the dog and understand. But, you know, you need to have a, you know, behavioural trainer um, come and help you with those specific problems. Don't chance it. Don't be trying things that you see on YouTube or via kind of like other social media platforms you you really need to get professional help where they can delve into the history of the dog with you the relationship that you have with the dog and and how to get the best outcome and work with that dog so thank you ladies for another wonderful pod dog episode to all of this then i hope that you've enjoyed it as much as i have and if you have any issues you can contact these lovely ladies within the LWDG or speak to one of our group about how you can get in contact with somebody in your area who would be able to help you with this problem. So that's all for this week. Have a lovely week and we shall see you all next week for another episode of Pod Dog. Thank you for listening to LWDG Pod Dog with me, Joe Parrott. Now we all know training a dog takes time, energy and patience, but our lives can be really, really busy. Don't worry, the LWDG has got you covered. Join us for our free planning workshop where we'll show you how to use short 10 minute training sessions each day to fast forward your dog's education. Our experts have years of experience in training dogs and will help you get started on the right foot. Register now and start making progress with your furry friend today. Go to our Facebook page, The Ladies Working Dog Group and click on the pinned post or visit www.thelwdg.com. Bye.